From Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, confronting the rise of extremism in the world of online video games. One study finding around four in 10 Americans personally experienced some sort of harassment online, particularly those bad for gamers of color. They say this is typical of what happens on the online gaming community. They call it a racist, toxic environment, and they're doing it all while they're just trying to do the simplest of things, have a good time and play a video game. I listened in on a gaming session and the black gamer was told by someone he was playing with online, you need handcuffs and a knee on your neck. In December, the Anti-Defamation League released a study that found white supremacist ideas have gained significant exposure in the past year through online video games. One in five adult game players in the ADL survey reported encountering other players who promoted the superiority of white people over people of other races. And the report also found 15% of teen and pre-teen gamers said they interacted with white supremacists. The ADL study and other recent research about extremists using video games to spread their ideology has led to calls for video game makers to do more to stop hate on their platforms. And it sparked concerns that a rise in hateful ideology online will lead to greater acceptance of racism and extremism in the real world. These questions have even caught the attention of the U.S. government. Cecilia D'Anastasio covers the video game industry for Bloomberg, and she joins me now from New York to explain. Cecilia, over the years, we've seen video games blamed for any number of social ills. Politicians have said violence in video games leads to school shootings and other violent crimes, even though there's not a lot of evidence that it's true. So... Now we're seeing the sharp increase in people saying gamers are spreading white supremacist ideology. Do we know if hate groups that spread their views in gaming communities are having success in actually turning other players into white supremacists? Yeah, I mean, there's been such a long history of this with video games. There's the satanic panic, even with Dungeons and Dragons, which is a pen and paper game in the 70s. There's this idea that video games um, inspire people to commit violent acts in real life, which has been disproven over and over and over again in decades of studies, including amazing longitudinal studies by amazing researchers. And now there's this idea that there are people who are getting radicalized through video games. And that's I don't think there's anyone out there who studied this who would say that's not happening at all. The question is, what is the scale? And the reason why it's so hard to measure is because video game companies really don't share their data with a lot of people on this topic. There's only one video game, Roblox, that has a um, really specific anti-white supremacist, anti-neo-Nazi policy on its platform. And that's not to say gaming companies don't take this seriously. They do Activision Blizzard, Riot Games, all of these top gaming companies have issued statements to Bloomberg saying that you know this is something that they are paying attention to. But when it comes to handing that data off to outside researchers who really do have expertise in this topic, it's just, it's a black box. So let's say they were to hand over this data. What is it? I'm playing a game. And what happens to me in the scenario where someone who is trying to fill my mind with these ideas, what, what does that look like? First, I want to tell you what it probably doesn't look like. And then I'll tell you what it does look like. So say I'm playing Fortnite and I am in a game with a random person. We both drop down onto the map. We get our guns and we go out and we try and find people to shoot. Maybe we're on voice chat. And if I'm good at that game, I'm going to be playing it for maybe like 10 minutes before I'm in a new game. But if I'm the average person, this stranger that I meet in the video game has like three to five minutes to pitch me on their views before, you know, we are just kind of gone forever into the abyss and we never encounter each other. So it's as you're playing the game, you're carrying on a conversation. So it's like uh, that's part of the appeal is that you're actually reaching out to real people as you're playing this game. Video games are communication channels. 
That's correct. And it's a great way to meet people online. But at the same time, it's unlikely that you are going to, in the span of three to five minutes, be converted to have these really heinous and dangerous beliefs. What's more likely is where you do meet people through a video game who also have these beliefs and over time being exposed to them, they become normalized for you. And depending on your background, depending on your beliefs, your family situation, these beliefs might appeal to you and you might adopt them yourself. And that's something that can happen through playing a video game with someone, through talking to them on Discord, through communicating with them over Reddit or Facebook or Instagram or anything. The question that researchers are trying to grapple with right now is to what extent is this a video game specific issue versus a social media issue that's more generalized? Have you found in your reporting that the kind of approaches that you describe can draw people in? Absolutely. I published a feature with Wired Magazine in 2021 about an individual who goes by Ferguson, and he was playing Roblox, which is one of the most popular games around right now. 59 million people play Roblox every day. And when he was 11, he's now in his 20s, he encountered somebody on Roblox who was running these military drills. They, he would just sort of run around in circles for hours and hours and hours, and he could only say, yes, no, sir. And he became connected to this individual who we in the story called Malcolm. And over time, they began to kind of engage in these role-playing scenarios through avatars in these video games. And they really liked playing the bad guys. This individual, Malcolm, who Ferguson was introduced to, was also someone who was very much an internet edgelord. Somebody who generally is very much online, who kind of trades in inappropriate memes and has a really edgy sense of humor and is very intentionally irreverent, spends a lot of time on 4chan, spend a lot of time trading in very inappropriate and offensive memes. And 4chan, of course, is this online uh, chat group, which is sort of overrun with some pretty nasty stuff. Extremely nasty stuff, really, really heinous stuff in some instances. Ferguson, Malcolm, and several other people ended up being a part of this group that included at some point 20,000 people role-playing ancient Rome, and they had all of these laws that kind of, in the end, amounted to fascism. They had degeneracy laws that outlawed homosexual relationships. They were anti-Semitic in a lot of ways as well. And I interviewed a lot of people who were involved in this group about the impact that participating in it had on them. And, you know, some of them look back on it and say, wow, that was quite literally us role-playing fascism as children. And other people look back on that group and are actually in law enforcement now and are in the TSA. And some people also took something different from that and did become acclimated to those beliefs later on. Cecilia, one of the problems here, and you're grappling with it here and in your reporting, is how concerned we should be about this. Uh, Years ago, there was the Gamergate revelations where women gamers, women game developers were under just absolutely vicious attack from certain male gamers who didn't want them in their world. That had real-world consequences, and there was a backlash from it. But as you also say, sometimes it's overblown the amount to which what happens in the gaming world then comes into real life. So when you look at this, as you do all the time, how do you weigh and measure how concerned people should be about white supremacy in the online gaming world? I think it's hugely alarming that teen and preteen gamers have been exposed to white supremacist views over video games. And by the way, it's one in five adults. Um, And that was double the rate in 2021. So this is clearly an issue, and it's something that a lot of researchers are begging gaming companies to take more seriously. I think that parents should be extremely concerned about the people who their kids are associating with over the internet and in online games. Because online games are communication channels, and you're not just playing an online game with someone when you really click with them. You're also friending them on Instagram, communicating with them over the gaming chat app Discord. Maybe you're following them on Twitter. You know, it's not limited to the video game. So I think we should take it seriously. At the same time, I think it's really important to understand exactly what we're talking about, which is not an issue that's localized to video games, but an issue that is integral to the nature of social media. There are a lot of companies out there that have huge populations of users and don't think about moderation up front, don't think about 
how to cultivate communities that are inclusive and not harmful. And that's a major design problem and a major philosophy problem that we've seen on Twitter, on Facebook, everywhere on the internet. And gaming companies are not at all excluded from that. Cecilia, you don't just cover the gaming industry, you play games a lot yourself. Have you encountered this sort of thing just in your playing of these games? Yeah, I mean, you can tell that I have like a feminine voice. And so when I play video games over voice chat and I really like playing competitive games in particular, I have received a lot of comments that I would describe as heinous and unwelcome when I'm just trying to sort of hang out after work. And a lot of people experience that based on the way that their voice sounds or details that they share over video games. And it's on gaming companies to create more inclusive environments where people can feel safer just enjoying their hobby after work. It's something that's pushed a lot of women and minorities out of gaming culture. And that's not fair because half of gamers are women. And a lot of us will just sort of do it in private and play single player games. Um, I've talked to a lot of women who don't play multiplayer games, even though they enjoy them, because in order to be good at the game, a lot of the time you do have to be communicating with your voice and they just don't want to deal with it. And so how do you design a game to do that? Is it that it shuts you down if you use a certain language or um, behavior? It's kind of the million dollar question. That's probably a multi-million dollar question at this point. But what scientists say who study this is that if you make it really easy to report people in video games and make the report forms extremely easy to decipher, both for the person who is reporting and the person who takes the report, more people will actually participate in that system. Plus, if you give people positive reinforcement for doing a report, so for example, if you tell them like, hey, that person you reported was actually banned later, they're going to feel like the loop was closed and they were rewarded for doing a good thing. Where do you see this heading? Do you think that gaming becomes a kinder, gentler place in the next three years, five years? Or do you think that things become more abrasive? I think it's going to go in both directions because, as we saw with this Anti-Defamation League survey, exposure to white supremacist beliefs inside of online games doubled between 2021 and 2022. That is a huge issue and alarming and definitely points to the need for gaming companies and potentially even politicians to address this. At the same time, Never before in history have gaming companies taken as seriously the need to moderate their platforms on the level that social media companies moderate their platforms. Gaming companies have hired cognitive scientists, sociologists, experts in extremism to keep their platforms inclusive um, so everybody can enjoy their games and everyone can also buy their games. It doesn't seem, though, according to this Anti-Defamation League survey, that gaming companies are doing anywhere near enough to mitigate the exposure of white supremacist beliefs to gamers and young teens. Cecilia D'Anastasio, thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you for having me. When we come back, showing game makers how to stamp out extremism. Let's continue this conversation with someone who studies online extremism for a living. Alex Newhouse is deputy director of the Middlebury Institute Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism, and he joins me now. Can you tell me first, what does the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism do? So our sort of like top level elevator pitch is that we're a mixed methods research center that's operating at sort of the emerging tech, emerging trends space in uh, especially right wing extremism, but also extremism broadly. And what that means is that we specialize in primarily the study of online extremism on things like social media platforms, uh, alternative tech platforms, and also video games. So today we're, of course, talking about extremism um, on online gaming. And last September, you got a grant from the Department of Homeland Security to actually study this. What is that money being used for? Yeah, we got awarded almost $700,000 to run a project that is actually going to developers, game developers across the country uh, and also in Canada, to talk with them about their processes and knowledge and awareness of the issues of extremist exploitation in games. So broadly, what we're trying to do is create basically a baseline for understanding, one, how prevalent is extremism in games, because that's still a pretty open question, and two, 
how prevalent is knowledge of these things at the game developer levels? How do they think about the issue of extremism in games? And is there some way that we can actually help them get better and build capacity and understanding how to resist that? So let's take those two things apart because they kind of are the big, the twin problems. In your research, how prevalent do you find this online extremism, these ideologies are in gaming? So one thing we absolutely know for sure is that white supremacists and far-right extremists in general, especially the very, very extreme ones, we're talking like accelerationist actors, the ones who literally believe in bringing about the apocalypse, are actively using all sorts of different games for the purposes of identity creation, communication, organization, recruitment, those kinds of things. But one of the things that we're trying to do in this project is just figure out, like, what is the extent of that? Because right now we know that they exist. We do not know the actual sort of extent of it, the volume of it, and the prevalence of it in these games. So when you say they are participating in these games, using these games, what exactly are they doing when they're on the gaming platforms? It really depends on the type of games. So a lot of games, especially the, the creation ones, will have some types of social networking features in them. For instance, the use of groups, which are like clans or, you know, like small, small, you know, sets of individuals. The names of those groups are references to white supremacist terrorist organizations. And these are the actual characters that you're role playing in the game. Right, and the types of like organizations that the players are creating and coming together to form. So we've seen everything from like an individual user's username that references the Christchurch New Zealand mass shooter, all the way up to like entire groups of hundreds of individuals that are references to like 1970s white supremacist terrorist organizations or designated far right terrorist organizations throughout the world. So that's obviously like the big one, like this sort of use of all of the different features of a game for the purpose of promoting and organizing their activities. But we also see some like more minor indicators. For instance, I've found references on like the Call of Duty leaderboard, just in usernames on the leaderboard to like Heinrich Himmler, Adolf Hitler, Nazi regime. So it really runs the gamut. One of the big challenges for me in tracking this is like there are so many different vectors of attack and vectors of misuse on these games that it's actually hard to kind of get a handle on. So that's what they're doing online and how they're using these games. And the second part you mentioned was how aware the gaming platforms themselves are of it and what they're doing to counteract it. Absolutely. And this also is a huge spectrum. Uh, there are many different types of game developers that range in size from a single person all the way up to the big ones that have tens of thousands of employees across the world. And so sort of correspondingly, there's going to be a huge range in awareness of these issues. But overall, what we find is that video game developers as a whole aren't thinking about these issues in the same way that like Facebook and Google and Microsoft are in general. And that's because the social networking aspects of games, the, the vectors that they exploit in games are sort of secondary to the central aspect of games, which is actually like the playing of it and the mechanics of the game that you're interacting with. And so as a result, the, the moderation of those social network features, the awareness and the, the policies that are in place to mitigate exploitation of them has been sort of secondary compared to the big social media companies. A lot of this project is filling in those gaps, is trying to connect different companies together and then also show them that like, hey, this is a huge problem. It's probably increasing in prevalence and this isn't going to go away on its own. And what's the response from the gaming industry when you go to them and say, hey, we're doing this project. We're going to try and come up with best practices to get rid of this, help you out. Are they very eager to work with you? It is, uh, it's a mixed bag we have found. Um, some developers are very, very eager to work with us. Others sometimes have to be a little bit scared into it. And this is something that my research center works in the tech sector as well is, you know, there are some companies that are fully aware of the problem and actually actively come to us and ask us for help in getting a handle on it. And there are others that we have to put together a suite of examples that say, hey, do you know that there's a designated terrorist organization operating on your platform currently? And they say no, and then we're like, hey, we can help you deal with that. If we don't have that sort of the, the aspect of giving them examples and, and telling them we're here to help you, we're not here to tear you down, uh, a lot of times we will get a bit of a cold shoulder. As awareness of these issues increase and coverage of them and, and public pressure on these companies increases over time, that has been changing and we have seen a lot more cooperation over the past even six months. Uh, relative to the last year. But we do still find that there is a reticence on the part of some 
people in the games industry to address these issues. It's easier in some cases to ignore it and hope that it doesn't exist than it is to take it on and acknowledge that you have a bunch of potential terrorists using your platform. You would think that a gaming platform would really want to stamp this out rather than allow its uh, game to become a place where toxic culture spreads, which can't really be very good for business. Right. And that's one of our big arguments is that this is absolutely a huge negative uh, aspect and, and it has a massive, massively negative impact on the health of the community that they're trying to build. The problem is that, you know, putting together a trust and safety team from scratch is very expensive. And building content policies to try to address these kinds of things in a more nuanced way can be very expensive. One of the things that we've noticed is that with this Homeland Security grant, with the backing of the U.S. government and with the space to actually go to companies and say, hey, we want to help you. You don't have to give us money. Uh, we want to help you build these best practices. There's more appetite for it. Turns out people like to uh, get some help, if, especially if they don't have to do it alone and they don't have to spend a ton of money on it. The reaction has been pretty positive. We found a lot of people in the games industry to be willing to confront that kind of process. We'll be right back. Why do you think extremism is so common on games? There's so many different kinds of games, and yet it seems to be very widespread across genres. What is it about online gaming that makes it such an attractive place for extremism? There's two elements to this. So the first one is the more straightforward one, which is that, you know, generally most of the individuals who are participating in them are young. They're under 30 in the vast majority of cases. A lot of the accelerationist groups that we study were founded by teenagers and recruit teenagers right out of high school. And ultimately, teenagers are spending a lot of their time on all sorts of different games. And it's just a nature of where the mainstream youth culture goes, so to do extremists. This idea that games provide some sort of unique social bonding opportunities is, is a very powerful one and it has been used and studied for years on the positive sense of like, friendships are made in games more easily than they are in other types of social media and that kind of thing. But we've just recently started untangling the negative aspects of that, the potential for those really strong social bonds to actually have that sort of darker element to it. Extremists don't have, you know, all this social science data to back them up, but there is this sort of sense among them, and I've seen this in chat rooms, that games provide this sort of particularly amenable area for recruitment, for mobilization, for radicalization, for getting people into that frame of mind to be more amenable to carrying out violent action or to be more dedicated to the cause of the extremist organization. You know, one of the arguments that um, people in the gaming community have made for years, and I think it's backed up by research, is that playing video games doesn't necessarily cause violent behavior in real life. Is the idea of recruiting people into extremist groups to bring them into extremist ideologies different from that? The studies have backed up this idea that, like, playing violent video games, the consumption of violent content, does not have a direct link to violence in the real world. What we are currently working on right now is a more indirect, more sort of amorphous relationship. We're not focusing on content necessarily really at all. Um, we may in the future start looking at content a little more seriously. We think that there may be some actual, some like nuanced indirect relationships with the actual content. But for the moment, what we're looking at is actually the relationships that are built in game. And that is very different than what the type of game actually is. And it's what we find is that like, it, it's really sort of a, the nature of games broadly, the way that the social interactions within games happen that is driving this possibility of like an increased vulnerability to extremism and radicalization. That is very, very different than the old school theory of like, you play Call of Duty, you become a mass shooter. Um, really what it's talking about is like, you are more likely to find the type of community and to be primed mentally to be integrated into those types of communities that have a penchant for promotion of white supremacy or inciting real world violence than you would if you weren't playing games to that level. We're still in the very nascent stages of untangling these types of correlations, and they're probably going to end up being very complex. But we're starting to get a sense of like, there is definitely something going on in the video game space that is unsavory, and that is not something that we want to promote. 
there's this whole setup, there's this whole mental state that you enter, there's this whole set of social interactions that you encounter in games that may predispose you to being more likely to be radicalized. It is estimated that women now make up about half of all gamers, and yet women and girls say they're still treated like a minority and often face harassment. In addition to extremism, uh, for many years there's been a problem of a hostile environment to women, to LGBTQ uh, game players. Is that something that you're also studying as a part of this look at the culture of games? Yeah, absolutely. What's really fascinating is that we've known for decades that game culture has an unfortunate close proximity to toxicity and especially sexism, misogyny, anti-LGBTQ action, those kinds of things. The study of extremism in games is relatively new. The study of toxicity in games has substantial history, so we can kind of use the study of that, of toxicity, as a proxy for finding indicators of extremist activity 20 years ago, 30 years ago, even though people weren't thinking about it in the same way then. Um, and the reason for that is because toxicity is, in a lot of cases, a tactic used by extremists for a whole host of things, for encouraging participants to be more primed to getting radicalized, for undertaking their own ideological goals. Harassment and hate are tools used by white supremacists for the purposes of intimidating their enemies and encouraging their sort of in-group to be more collaborative with each other and more loyal to the in-group um, rather than the out-group. That isn't to say that all toxic players are extremists. Rather, toxicity is just one set of tools that are used by extremists pretty frequently and often very frequently in games. In the 2000s, when coordinated harassment campaigns were first getting innovated, a lot of times they were getting innovated in games spaces like early virtual world sims, early social networking games like Second Life and other types of games like that. That was where these like decentralized networks of, of toxic actors would be coordinating and, and carrying out their campaigns of harassment. And so a lot of what we see in toxicity broadly across the internet was really innovated in video games. So there's a really fascinating relationship there. And a lot of those people early on who innovated the, the toxic actions ended up becoming right-wing extremists later on. I suppose if you're a person, especially a young person, who does not feel very powerful in your regular life, coming into an online world where you can essentially be a bully of others can make you feel powerful? Yeah, and you have all these networks, both in-game and in the game-adjacent spaces, that are telling you that what you're doing is right and celebrating you and giving you friendships and giving you that sort of like those dopamine hits of positive social interactions. One of the things I always remind games industry people is that this focus on toxic content is great and we need to crack down on it. But the problem is toxicity is a negative relationship. Like the person carrying it out is trying to make the target feel intimidated, is make them feel bad. And so self-reports are easier to generate and take action against. Radicalization, so the person who carries out the harassment then gets radicalized by a community who's celebrating them, all of those radicalization interactions are very positive. The target of the radicalization is supposed to feel welcomed. They're supposed to feel connected. They're supposed to feel rewarded. And that is really, really hard to detect solely from like self-reports or from a reactive sense, because if you feel good, you're not going to report a radicalization attempt to the game developers. So absolutely, there's this huge interplay there between toxicity on the one hand, and then the networks of people who are trying to recruit the toxic actors into their networks. You spend a lot of time looking at the darkest side of online gaming. Is there any reason for optimism? Is there anything that makes you actually feel hopeful about what can be done? I'm a huge gamer, like I've been a gamer my whole life. And one of the things we've seen borne out by the research is that games are incredibly positive. Like a lot of the interactions, a lot of the unique characteristics that I was just describing are more generally and more often very, very positive. Extremism is a fringe thing. It is a minority of individuals who end up in extremism. So one of the optimistic sides here is that for most people, the interactions in a game are positive. Like you you end up in good pro-social relationships and, and connections. And for people who might be, you know, lonely or introverted or having trouble making friends in the real world, games can be a really, really powerful tool for, you know, surmounting some of those obstacles. And they have been for, for you know, m tens of millions of people throughout the world. And so the big challenge then is how do we make sure that we're maximizing that that positive impact, maximizing the the conversion of people into pro-social actors. 
and minimizing those types of people who might be more vulnerable to the darker sides of it. And I think that question is solvable. Like I think we are seeing a lot of companies do a lot of investment in incentivizing pro-social behavior uh, and in having some of the more like more types of content moderation that are designed to encourage and reward good behavior rather than just crack down on bad behavior. And I think there's some really encouraging signs from the industry that they're moving in the right direction there. And my hope is that with this project, we can help galvanize that a little bit more. Alex Newhouse, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks for having me on. You can read more of Cecilia Donasasio's reporting at Bloomberg.com. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at Bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicky Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Mo Barrow and Michael Falero. Raphael M. Seeley is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. Take.